We move then to the third riddle. So if the first two illustrate Darwin's naturalism, its concept of a purposeless nature, the second indicates the non-progressive character of the process, which of course makes human beings not rulers by right over this earth. That's what it's really about. Now the third issue, why the delay? Why does Darwin wait so long? Why does he wait 20 years? Now, obviously, well, put it a different way. The old view, what I like to call the optimistic, unrealistic view, held it that he always knew exactly what he wanted, but he was collecting data assiduously. And it just took him 20 years to get all the proofs he needed. That would be lovely. It's a nice mythology. But you look at Darwin's life, it's clearly not so. What was Darwin doing during those 20 years? His main activity was to spend eight years writing a four-volume taxonomy of barnacles. Now, I'm a systematist by profession. Those were very valuable works. But look, folks, you don't have to be Freud to understand that when someone's sitting on what he knows to be the most important and radical notion in the history of biology, he don't spend eight years working on the taxonomy of barnacles in the middle of it. That's called displacement activity by anyone. Darwin was obviously afraid. That's the point I'm getting at. Let me just read you his own assessment of his barnacle work. He writes, besides discovering, this is autobiography late in life, several new and remarkable forms, I made out the homologies of the various parts. And I prove the existence in certain genera of minute males, complemental to and parasitic on their hermaphrodites. Nevertheless, I doubt whether the work was worth the consumption of so much time. So there's Darwin's own assessment, and I think that's fair enough. Now, clearly Darwin was afraid of something. So the question then becomes, what was he afraid of? Why didn't he want to publish? And the obvious answer would be, but it's wrong, like so many obvious answers, is that clearly Darwin must have been afraid of exposing his belief in evolution. That sounds right, but when you think about it in detail, it can't be, for the following reason. Evolution was the most common unorthodoxy in all 19th century biology. You didn't risk your career by expressing a belief in evolution. Of the three great naturalists in France at the turn of the century, two of them, Geoffroy and Lamarck, were evolutionists, and the third, Cuvier, was not. Many of the greatest scientists in England were evolutionists. No, it may have been an unorthodoxy, a mild unorthodoxy, but no one risked career by expressing a belief in evolution. It can't have been that. I think clearly what it was for Darwin was his own understanding that what put him in some danger for reputation, for acceptability, was not the belief in evolution, but the radical character of his own mechanism of the way in which evolution occurred in his system. And Darwin's very explicit about that. We're not just conjecturing. There's been a lot of Darwinian scholarship in the last 20 years, pioneered, pioneered by Howard Gruber's wonderful book, Darwin on Man, which makes it quite clear that Darwin's own fear was to expose what he took to be the philosophical materialism behind his view of how evolution occurred. Now, by philosophical materialism, of course, I do not mean love of whatever car and clothing is popular these days. I mean the philosophical position that this is not a dual world, as the Cartesian tradition proclaims, of spirit and matter of two realms, with spirit as the more important, but it is a material realm in which matter is the true source of all existence, and whatever we call spirit is an illusion born of complex organization of matter in the human brain. And Darwin was actually very clear about this in his notebooks that he kept privately in 1836, 1837, he writes at one point, the love of the deity, an effective organization, that is the organization of the brain inventing the notion of the deity. Oh, you materialist, saying to himself, why is thought being a secretion of brain more wonderful than gravity as a property of matter? It is only our arrogance and our admiration of ourselves. He couldn't ask for a clearer statement. And here's another. He actually tells himself, do not express the belief in materialism. He says, to avoid stating how far I believe in materialism, say only that emotions, instincts, degrees of talent, which are hereditary, are so because brain of child resembles parent stock. In other words, don't say that there's inheritance of mental features because the brain is fully material. Nuance that. Don't talk about it. Now, why was that so important? To Darwin. First of all, just empirically, Darwin knew that overt materialists did lose, if not life and limb, at least reputation and livelihood in the 1820s and 1830s. There were several documented cases that Darwin himself had witnessed. Darwin was not hurting for money. He was a wealthy English squire, basically, but he was very zealous of reputation and wanted his viewpoints to go forward and not be dismissed as 
cranky for being overly radical without support. I suppose the most radical manifestation of his belief in materialism came in the domain of religion because Darwin did not shrink from the deepest implications of his own philosophical materialism. For example, though his own views on personal religion are really quite unclear, he was at least an agnostic, whether he's an atheist, not, not clear, he may have maintained some personal notion of a personal God, but he was very clear that his materialist views certainly led him to the idea that the conventional notion of uh, an omnipotent male deity, the white the guy in the white beard sitting on the clouds, was a kind of double illusion based on his materialist views. Why a double illusion? Because what there is only is the complex matter of the brain. That's matter. But because the matter is so complex that it thinks, it develops a concept of mind that it then reifies into an independent realm of existence. And then mind invents the notion of God, the white male with a beard on the clouds, and so that kind of a god is a double illusion based on the material substrate of the brain. And that, folks, was a radical notion that was really not expressible in Victorian Britain. I don't know that there's any tradition so deep as Cartesian dualism and the notion that of the two realms, spirit is by far the higher and most important. This is John Milton. This is L'Allegro e del Penseroso, the happy and the thoughtful characters. This is Il Penseroso, the thoughtful. She is sitting in a tower at night, looking out at the stars and says, Oh, let my lamp at midnight hour be seen in some high lonely tower where I may oft out watch the bear, that's the Big Dipper constellation, or unsphere the spirit of Plato to unfold what worlds or what vast regions hold the immortal mind that hath forsook her mansion in this fleshly nook. Let us consider that last couplet, because that says it all. The immortal mind that hath forsook her mansion in this fleshly nook. So, so the mind rests within this fleshly nook of the brain, but can soar out, and that is the higher immortal realm. And so there, in a nutshell, though there is an epilogue to this, we have the three radical characteristics of Darwin's theory. The purposelessness, the naturalism inherent in the Beagle and its captain story. The lack of progressivism, which dethrones human beings from this key realm of predictable ruling, which comes out of the second riddle about why he doesn't use the word evolution. The philosophical materialism, which takes the inherent spiritual directional dimension out of evolution that comes from the issue of his delaying for 20 years. Finally, he did publish. In 1859, Wallace was on his tail. Uh, Victorian Britain had settled down to enormous social stability. He wasn't as worried anymore, and finally he let it come out. But those are the three radical characteristics. And they are why most people, or many people in this culture, to this day are uncomfortable with Darwinism, why many of his countrymen rejected it, why 100 and now 130 years without Darwin are quite enough, but we're still mainly without it.